Now let's get back to the, the uh, text that we're getting into, but a little bit of background. You know, Jesus made a strange remark when four disciples came to him for a confidential briefing on his second coming. He includes a strange remark. He says, as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now most of us don't really understand what he meant because we don't know what the days of Noah were like. We know all about Noah's flood, but we may not have studied the reasons the flood came. What problem was it solving? Well, the world was very sinful. If that's the case, we better get some life jackets. No, there's something deeper, I believe, behind all this. But as the days of Noah, but as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. In Genesis chapter 6, it opens up with a strange passage. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and took them wives of all which they chose. Now the first point I'd like you to notice, because most people miss this, is those two verses, Genesis 6 verses 1 and 2, are a single sentence. And that, that will aid us from making some mistakes here. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. It's men in general and daughters in general. That the sons of God, and we'll come back to that term, it's a very special term, saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives of all which they chose. This term, sons of God, is, the, is benai ha Elohim. This term is used in the Old Testament of angels. Every place it appears, it's of angels. In the Old Testament, it appears in Job, uh, three different places, Job 1, 6, 2, 1, and 38, 7. In the New Testament, you get the equivalent thing in Luke chapter, uh, chapter 20, verse 36. There is a Hebrew uh, book. It's not part of the Bible. I'm not going to suggest that it's inspired, but it's a valuable book for grammar and vocabulary. It emerged about two centuries before Christ. It was very popular for several many centuries, called the Book of Enoch. It wasn't really... Enoch, it was compiled by some rabbis, but it does demonstrate the belief that they had in those days, and it also helps us with the vocabulary and the grammar, and it uses this term the same way, of angels in great depth. Perhaps even more authentically, the Septuagint translation. Three centuries before the ministry of Jesus Christ, the Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek. The Greek is a very, very precise language. The best scholars they could find came from Jerusalem to Alexandria to do this work. It took 15 years for them to, to uh, make the translation. And the Greek is very specific, and it does uh, uh, illuminate this passage in the direction we're talking about. We also find this passage, the daughters of men, Benoth Adam. These are daughters of Adam. I want to emphasize that because some people try to make this something else. That's, it's the daughters of Adam. So this is the same term as in, in the earlier part of the sentence in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. When you get down to verse 4 of chapter 6 of Genesis, it says there were Nephilim in the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. So this word Nephilim is another word that's important to understand. It's a very uh, uh, distinctive word. It, it means the fallen ones. It comes from the verb nephal, which is to fall away, to be cast down away, to fall away, to desert, if you will. The Nephilim are the fallen ones. These give rise to the Hagibarim, the mighty ones. And we'll, we'll hear more about them as we get through the scripture. Now the Septuagint, that is the Greek translation of this, the word Nephilim was translated gigantes, and, uh, which is rendered in your English Bible as giants. Now, they did happen to be giants. That's another issue. But the word gigantes doesn't really mean giants. It comes from gigas, which means earthborn. So in the Greek, they're the earthborn. In the Hebrew, they're the fallen ones. These are hybrids. These are something unique and strange. Furthermore, when you get to verse 9 of Genesis 6, it speaks of Noah's family tree. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Same phrase we used with Enoch, interestingly enough. But he was perfect in his generations. This word in the Hebrew is tamim, which means without blemish, sound, healthful, without spot, unimpaired. It's a term used of physical defects. What this says in the Hebrew is that Noah's genealogy was not tainted, was not blemished, 
by the goings on. And, uh, and uh, so, what we're suggesting here is that a fallen angels came down to the earth and contrived some way to generate hybrids. And um, I believe that this was Satan's strategy to try to corrupt the human uh, line, to try to avert any possibility of a redeemer. And uh, we'll talk more about that as it goes. It, so this is what's called the angel view of Genesis 6. And we'll get into this more. But if this is valid, we would expect... This is a very strange idea, I grant you. But if this is valid, we would find it confirmed in the New Testament. It, it, things are always confirmed by two or three witnesses. In Jude, chapter, uh, in, in, for only one chapter, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 is the following. Jude says, The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude is making another point, but he makes reference to not only Sodom and Gomorrah, but these angels which went after strange flesh in, uh, in uh, Genesis chapter 6. Peter also talks about this in uh, I'm on, I'll, I'll come back by the way to Jude this wor verb uh, this uh, hap word habitation the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation we'll come back to that in second Peter a similar remark is made Peter says for if God spared not the angels that sinned but cast them down to Tartarus he uses a strange word it's translated hell in your Bible but it's a strange word it's the only place that this word occurs in the Bible cast them down to Tartarus, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, and he goes on. He adds an interesting thing. He ties this strange going on to the days of Noah. But this word Tartarus probably deserves a little comment because it's, uh, it's unique here. It's not unique in Greek. It's used in other literature, but it's the only place in the Bible that occurs. Tartarus was to the Greeks. It's a term for the dark abode of woe. It's the pit of darkness of the unseen world. In Homer's Iliad, it's described as being as far below Hades as the earth is below heaven. So I still don't know where it is, but I don't want to go there. Uh, we, we, we feel it, it, it's an illusion, we believe, uh, to, uh, to not, only, not only to Hades, but maybe a very special part of it. Now this whole idea of angels, fallen angels, coming down and mixing with human women to create a hybrid is a strange concept, but we're startled to discover that legend, it gives rise to legends in every ancient culture. The Greek Titans are probably familiar to most of us from the, in the Western world. The Titans were part of the Greek mythology, partly terrestrial, partly celestial. They rebelled against their father Uranus, and after a prolonged contest were defeated by Zeus, and then condemned into Tartarus. That's all part of the Greek mythology, but apparently embodies a memory of some serious things that did happen in those uh, in the uh, in the prehistory. These legends we'll find in Sumer, Assyria, in Egypt, the Incas, Mayan, the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh. You'll find these uh, equivalent legends in Persia, obviously in Greece, in India, Bolivia, South Sea Islands, even the Sioux Indians. It's interesting. I'm told by the anthropologists that uh, the American Indians, when they met a stranger, they would hold up a hand. This business of how is Hollywood stuff. But holding up a hand, they, if you had a stranger, you wanted to count his fingers. Because they had a terror of the six-fingered men. And they have legends in the, uh, of all kinds among the uh, American Indians of these giants that populated the earth, came down from, they call them, some call them the star people. They were very, very large, very powerful. And there's, you even find allusions to these in Buffalo Bill's uh, uh, autobiography and uh, so on. So... In the classic art, we have, At we have uh, Hercules, who was, a, who was a Nephilim in Hebrew, and Atlas. These, were, these, uh, these legends uh, derive from uh, the same kind of these hybrids. Now, there is an alternative view. This is, uh, there are many people uh, that are graduates from seminaries that have never been exposed to the angel view that I'm sharing with you. They've been taught, many people have been taught, that the sons of God term really ref refers to the line of Seth. Uh, Seth, these were presumably the good guys. 
And uh, it, the, the, the sons of God is a term they try to ascribe to the Sethite leadership. And the daughters of Adam, they say, well, it really wasn't the daughters of Adam, it was daughters of just Cain. And uh, I don't know what's wrong with the daughters of the others, but anyway. Um, and the sin that, that's involved there is the failure to maintain separation. They try to make the, they said the line of Seth should be separate, and they commingled with Cain, the daughters of Cain. They should have done that. Uh, so the failure of separation, they assume, is the, the sin involved. The problem with this, this command to stay separate is 11 chapters later, or uh, anyway, uh, substantial uh, chapters later. And they don't explain why the offspring of these two families would be supernaturally weird, uh, uh, the Nephilim, which were the, uh, dis obviously distinctive. This view, the so-called line of Seth view, emerged in the 5th century. Celsus and Julian the Apostate used the traditional belief of these fallen angels and so forth to attack Christianity, and Julius Africanus resorted to the Sethite theory as a more comfortable way of defending the Scripture. And uh, that was fine, except, and Cyril of Alexander used it to repudiate the Orthodox position. They said the Orthodox position was quaint but not true. And Augustine embraced the Sethite th theory, and by his doing so, it became the primary doctrine of the medieval church and has endured uh, through uh, the derivative denominations from the Reformation and the rest of it. So it prevails right into the Middle Ages. However, the text itself said the sons of God has never used of believers in the Old Testament. Seth was not God. Cain was not Adam. These are all contrivances. And there's no mentions of the daughters of uh, Elohim. It, it, it's unbalanced. There's an antithesis, uh, a grammatical antithesis that is ignored, and I won't get into that here. The lines were separated later. It isn't until Genesis 11 that we have the separation imposed. And that was only on Isaac, uh, Ishmael not so. And furthermore, Genesis 6 says all flesh was corrupted. There were no good guys, if you will. And uh, Noah found grace, and that's a whole other issue. But only Enoch and Noah's eight are spared. Now, th think about this. God chose to wipe out the entire world except for nine people. He removes Enoch first. And then these eight on the barge or boat that we'll get to are spared, and uh, and also these uh, the um, uh, these uh, Barha Elohim took wives. It doesn't sound like they had any choice in the matter. They chose who they wanted to. And why did the if the Sethites were the good guys, why did they uh, perish in the flood? And furthermore, Enosh, who had Seth's son is the guy that initiated defiance of God, if you study the, uh, the text carefully. See, in Genesis 4, verse 26, in the previous chapter, um, we discover if it's tra there's a mistranslation. Men began to call upon the name of the Lord. It says, no, men began to profane the name of the Lord. And that's in the tar Targum of Ankylos, the Targum of Jonathan. Uh, it, it, the the, transla the, he the uh, Hebrew translations are the most venerated translations among the rabbis. Make it quite clear that Enosh was, was bad news. So the, the, line, the, Seth were, the line of Seth was not uh, the good guys and Cain the bad guys. Quite the contrary. Cain murdered his brother, and he, yes, he did sin. But you'll also notice if you look at his genealogy, his children for several generations carried the name of God in them. I believe they were believers. I believe they were repentant believers. So, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, in, the, in the rabbinical literature, this, this is the one that supports this angel view of Genesis 6. The whole idea of the Nephilim being unnatural is important. Uh, the, uh, they had supernatural offspring, the so-called Hagiburim, the mighty men. And there's also this, there were no women of renown. What's going on here? And what made Noah's genealogy so distinctive? See, it's a gene pool problem that underlies the flood of Noah. Now, this angel view, of course, is a traditional rabbinical view. The Book of Enoch supports it. Not that it's, a ther not that it's inspired, but I'm speaking of vocabulary and grammar as well as other literature, the Testimony of Twelve Patriarchs, uh, jo uh, Josephus presents this, the Septuagint. The early church fathers taught this, Philo of Alexandria, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, and the rest of them. Uh, modern scholarship, G. H. Pember, DeHaan, McIntosh, Dillich, Gablin, Arthur W. Pink, Donald Gray Barnhouse, Henry Morris, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, Hal Lindsey, Chuck Smith, uh, modern scholarship also. Uh, embraces this. The Sethite view that most people have been taught, even in seminaries, is unscriptural. The text itself refutes it. The inferred separation is nonsense. The inferred godliness of Sethites is, is not true. The inferred Kenite uh, subset uh, Adamites, uh, the unnatural offspring, 
the New Testament confirmations. But perhaps the most important thing, and that's one reason I'm spending this time on it, you will not understand much of what happened in the Old Testament, and you won't understand some of the prophetic issues unless you understand this view. I used to think, well, it's just a view, and it's a, it's, it, there's two different views, and that's fine, let's go on, until I realized that this undergirds a great deal of, of, uh, of understanding or misunderstanding of the Old Testament, if you, whether or not you understand the, the angel view. You see, there were Nephilim after the flood also. And uh, Genesis 6, 4 said, there were in those days and also after that. And uh, you'll discover when Joshua goes into the land, when he finally gets in the land, there are at least four tribes, tribal names, that he's, he's instructed by God to wipe out every man, woman, and child of these tribes. The Rephaim, the Emim, the Horim, the Zamzumim. These were vestiges of the Nephilim. Uh, Arba, Anak, and his sons, the Anakim, when they encountered Canaan. It's in Numbers 13, 33. When Moses sends the uh, 12 spies into the land, to spy out the land, they, the 10 of them come back and say, we're grasshoppers in their sight. They're terrified. Uh, two of them, Joshua and Caleb, said, no, let's God, the Lord's on our side go. And they, uh, because they trembled and didn't go, they wandered for virtually 40 years in the wilderness. What did they encounter? They encountered Nephilim, Numbers 13, 33. There were Nephilim in the land. So it's important to understand this. Og, the king of Bashan, was the king of the giants. There were Nephilim up in the Golan Heights. That's in Deuteronomy 3 and Joshua 12 and so on. Goliath and his four brothers were Anakim, sons of Anak and, and so forth. See, these are stratagems of Satan. He was attempting to corrupt Adam's line. When we get to Genesis 12 and God calls Abraham and announces that his plan of redemption for man isn't just, his redemption doesn't just involve man, it's going to involve specifically Abraham and his descendants. Satan could then focus his attack on Abraham. The famine, the destruction of the male line in the Exodus. Pharaoh's even after he released him, Pharaoh pursues them to wipe them out. Satan is trying to wipe out the Jews because he's trying to wipe out God's um, program of redemption. When they finally return to, um, well, when God announces to Abraham that his descendants 400 years later are going to return to Canaan. That gave Satan four centuries to lay down a minefield. And he populated Canaan with these strange creatures. When God reveals that his plan is going to involve David, that allows Satan to focus his attack against David's line. And as you go right through the whole chronicle, from Second Chronicles, Isaiah, so on, you'll discover again and again there's attempts to wipe out the royal line, but there's always somebody that gets saved, a servant that saves a child and so forth to maintain that line. And uh, uh, even when you get to the book of Esther in the Persian Empire, Haman tries to wipe out the Jews. Again, it's a satanic plot, very analogous to what Hitler tried to do in more recent times. When you get to the New Testament, it continues. Joseph's fear when Mary's pregnant. That was a capital situation there. Herod's attempts to wipe out all the babies in Bethlehem when they try to throw Jesus off the cliff in Nazareth. There were two storms at sea, and I personally suspect that those storms were not normal storms. They were you know, exceptional storms. The, the disciples aboard were professional seamen that knew those waters, and they were terrified. Something strange going on there. And, of course, the ultimate thing is the cross, and it's still not through. One reason you need to understand this, because Satan is still at it in a variety of different ways. You need to understand that. Let's talk a little bit about angels, because I think they're often widely misunderstood. A uh, angels always seem to appear in human form. At Sodom and Gomorrah, they were there. The homosexuals wanted to attack them. It tells you something about angels. They're always in pairs at the resurrection, at the ascension, and other places. Angels spoke to men. They took people by the hand. They ate meals with them. The New Testament tells us that many of us have entertained angels unawares. So they apparently can take uh, human form. They are capable of direct physical combat. The Passover in Egypt was the result of the death angel in Egypt. The one angel, after dinner one night, slaughters 185,000 Syrians. And uh, so uh, this is, this is uh, we'll, we'll get into some of this as we get into... Uh, the, the, those descriptions. But the point is, angels are capable of materializing and engaging in physical combat. We do know that angels in heaven don't marry. Because uh, uh, marriage, uh, procreation is for mortal, be is a way of multiplying mortal people. These are not, the, the, they're, not designed, they're not intended to be uh, reproducing. 
Because they don't marry in heaven, many people assume they can't have sex. Let's be careful here. I think the scripture makes no restriction on angels, tech, the angel, uh, technology available to them, that especially if they're bent on mischief. And that's what we're dealing with here. Angels are formidable. Demons in the New Testament are very different creatures. They always seek embodiment. Angels can, are materialized. Demons can't. Demons appear to be powerless except to the extent that they can indwell a host of some kind. And they have to do that with permission, apparently. So we'll look, you want it, when you study your Bible, try to summarize what you think you'll learn about angels and summarize what you learn about demons, and I think you'll find they're distinctively different. See, in Matthew 22 and also Mark 12, he says, speaking of, of, um, of uh, believers that are in the resurrection body, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And that simply means that uh, sex and procreation is not part of the program there. That doesn't make any comment of what angels that are up to mischief might do. And this word habitation is a fascinating word. The word in the Greek is okaterion. It only appears twice in the Bible. It refers to the body as a dwelling place for the spirit. But it's used two places. In Jude 6, it's that which the angels had disrobed from. In 2 uh, Corinthians 5.2, it's alluding to the heavenly body that we aspire to as believers. And uh, in Jude 6, the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. There's that word, Ocaterian. And uh, in uh, 2 uh, Corinthians 5, uh, it says, we know that if our heavenly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, or our a habit or a habitation or a ocaterian, which is from heaven. So it's interesting. Same, ter same term. I think this is a highly technical term used in a very specific way. Well, it's all sea has its roots in Genesis 3 when God declares war on Satan. He says, I'll put enmity between thee, that's the Nachash, the shining one, and the woman between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And uh, so we have a conflict between two seeds. The seed of the woman from that passage becomes a title of Jesus Christ. It becomes a messianic label, the seed of the woman. Which incidentally is a contradiction in terms, because the seed is the man, not the woman. It's a contradiction in biology, not just grammar. But of course, it's, a, it's an illusion that Isaiah 7.14 7, uh, Isaiah 7, picks up as an indication of a virgin birth. And we'll talk more about that when we get there. But it also alludes to the seed of the serpent. There's another seed, the serpent being the red dragon. This is, these are allusions to the coming world leader who is assisted by a false prophet. And this duo is going to wreak havoc. And we'll deal with that when we get there too. But these forces are behind the world today. We need to recognize that. They have an agenda. That agenda is to entrap you into and bring you